The Unshackled Waves, episode 29. Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms here for this week's review episode. Uh, news and politics is now becoming quite volatile here both in Australia and overseas with smears and scandals now a daily occurrence. I'm joined once again uh, by my co-editor-in-chief of The Unshackled, Suka Fernando. Welcome back. Thanks Tim and hello everyone. So in the past week in Australia, we saw uh, power blackouts spread uh, uh, from the renewable energy heartland in South Australia. It went to New South Wales and Queensland. There was a sweltering heat wave last weekend in those states. So there was rolling blackouts in, in those states. It seems now, f- finally, major politicians on the right are jumping off the renewable energy and clim- climate change bandwagon, which is good, uh, given that the Australian people are more worried about uh, whether the power will remain on rather than if the planet will warm a a couple of degrees. The the Western Australian state election is now less than a month away with One Nation set to do very well. The Liberal government there is desperate to stay in power and have done a preference deal with One Nation which has upset the, the Nationals and caused a rift in the coalition. Overseas, we have seen the so-called deep state in the United States, uh, which is which that that is the intelligence community trying to uh, bring down uh, Donald, Tr- or they successfully brought down Donald Trump's national security advisor Michael Flynn, and more allegations emerging that uh, Trump is somehow compromised by the Russians. But we'll start with the blackout in West- Western Australia now. Uh, even even though I I live here in Victoria in a Labor state where we've got a uh, a high renewable energy target under Daniel Andrews uh, the, the power was was pr- was pretty good over uh, over the past weekend but uh, you're up in New South Wales too because there were there were blackouts where you are um yeah there were blackouts in fact there were blackouts in the next suburb but I was safe I never got the blackouts thank 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 God um but yeah there were blackouts and um you know, environmental factors do have an impact, and I think New South Wales was a different sort of um, story. But you know, South Australia, you could have avoided the blackouts. Um, you know, if they didn't have what they have right now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, the the energy minister in South Australia, he still denied that it was nothing to do with uh, renewables. He said, "Oh, it's because the 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 national uh, energy grid they didn't." Uh, apparently, uh, gi- uh, give uh, some of the power from this coal, fi- uh, uh, sorry, gas-fired power station to South Australia to help uh, to make sure that there weren't uh, rolling blackouts. So he said, "Oh, it- it's just something wrong with the national uh, energy market. Still, nothing to do with renewables." But uh, Jay Weatherall later said, even he conceded that, "Oh, maybe we need a new." gas-fired uh, power station to to help, uh, to help uh, keep, keep the power on regularly. So even he's now conceding that maybe uh, shutting down all the coal-fired power stations in South Australia wasn't a good idea. Yeah, I, mean, I think um, it's nice to see that the fact that this happened has resulted in the Liberals um, sort of realising that re- renewable energy isn't the way to go. I mean... In Q and A this week, we saw even um, uh, another uh, senator for, for, for Labor. She was saying, you know, it has nothing. To, it has nothing to do with renewables. It was because the power lines got got broken by the um, uh, by by the, by the weather. And you know, still in denial, still unable to accept reality and accept the fact that they're wrong. Um, but it's nice to see that the whole nation, and especially the Liberal Party, which is um, very, you know pro-climate change these days, it's nice to see that they are actually moving towards a more um, coal power sort of agenda because the, even they realized, you know, it doesn't work. We have Jay Weatherill, as you said, doesn't work. Um, and people are realizing that, you know, they don't work. You know, renewable energy is causing all this havoc. This is, what, the third time this happened already in South Australia, I think? Well, th- third or fourth. And, and yeah. it's, it costs the state's economy uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. Exactly. I mean, it was out, it's it's been out for, it was out for a very long time, and 
you know, shoppers can't do anything, businesses can't do anything, and it's all thanks to an incompetent left-wing government who's so intent on believing this false climate change rhetoric. Um, and that's, you know, the result is that the people, as usual, the people have to pay. Well, the, the excuse for uh, Queensland and New South Wales that, oh, it was because it was such an extreme uh, heat wave that, that caused uh, ex- excess uh, demand on the, on the en- energy uh, supply. But we have to remember that we've had hot days in Australia for, you know, since, since the beginning of time. I mean, Australia is a pretty warm country, but regular rolling blackouts, I mean, this is not normal. Like, I'm I'm reasonably old. Like I don't recall on hot days uh, su- suffering from from rolling blackouts. And on hot days is when you actually need the the electricity to work because uh, a lot of, a lot of people can, especially elderly people, can be quite uh, ill in a heat wave. Yeah, I mean, we have had bushfires. You know, we have had bushfires that took up an area the size of Texas, and we didn't have blackouts. But- back then we didn't have um you know power cuts back then no nothing happened we've had heat waves every year nothing i suppose they weren't as um hot as this year but still we have had heat waves that were you know nearly as hot as what we had um last week and we didn't have any blackouts so it's a very um foolish and people can see through the ex- excuse it's a very foolish excuse we can see through it, what they're saying and it doesn't work we know that they're lying they're trying to sort of keep people you know intentionally stupid by telling giving them all these excuses to make sure that their renewable energy um agenda is uh, fulfilled but you know we've had we've had these weather situations since forever and nothing like this has ever happened yeah, and it's it's completely unexpe- unacceptable in this modern era to be without power for, for any length of time. I mean, uh, uh, businesses need uh, electricity for their refrigeration if they've got perishable products. Uh, uh, in- industry needs electricity to make sure that their plant- plants are operating and also... Uh, and also uh, to communicate to communicate with each other i mean uh we're we're all reliant on the internet computers uh, uh telephones to make to make sure that you know we we, we can you know, not just do business but also uh live as well yeah i mean we are reliant on technology a lot um People would argue. People on both sides would argue that might be a bit. Um, oh yeah, the, the left would yeah. say, "Oh, you know, we should learn to live without electricity." They'd, they'd all a lot. Of, a lot of people on the left would like us to, you know, go back to living in in sto- in a stone age society. Well, yeah, that, the left can go extreme, but even people on the right would say, you know, we do rely too much on technology um, in terms of our personal lives. Um, but again. We still agree. Those people still agree that electricity is important for other for other things, for important um, things, for strategic um, things. So, as I said, shopping centres. Um, you know, um, people need electricity for hospitals. And the left might say, you know, we need to stop relying on technology uh, yeah, so much. Yeah, cooking your food without electricity. Yeah, I mean, again, from personal for, for our personal lives, you know, I, I suppose we can um, sort of reduce our reliance. But what I'm saying is, even people on the right traditionalists who are sort of a bit um, anti-modern, anti-modernism, um, even we would argue, you know, you need electricity for almost everything. Yes, the personal lives are a different issue and the left is doing nothing by talking about going back to caveman times. But, you know, we need, you still need electricity for strategic things, shopping centers, hospitals, yeah. schools, and, and remember people with um, the uh, medical supplies at home. So medical, they need electric electricity for those yeah as hospital well. so, patients as well yeah exactly I mean, yeah they, they need to be hooked up to machines which are powered yeah. by electricity exactly yeah so you know the left can argue you know we should stop relying on it well they haven't really thought about it um closely have they yeah. i i remember uh back in this this was back when i was about eight or nine in 1998 there was a there was a gas explosion at one of our gas plants and that meant that we were without hot water for around two weeks and everyone couldn't like found it difficult to cope like not having a warm shower uh and not being able to turn that turn the gas stoves on and so this is 
So that was that was gas, which is a different uh, power source. But it, but it's the same with electricity. Like yeah, I I, I recall li- living through that and how difficult it was. And now we're 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 beginning to see. Um, a, a, a lot of the time people are having to go without electricity. I mean, it, it's not a way to live. And all this push to renewable uh, en- uh, energy, it's supposed to save the planet from uh, f- global warming uh, oh, and to save our children's future. But, uh, you know, bringing up, having children live without reliable electricity, that's not much of a future. I mean, uh, having the price of electricity uh, extremely high, which makes our uh, industry and businesses uncomfortable competitive, which has led to uh, higher youth unemployment, especially in South Australia. I mean, that's not a good future for children. So yes, we are worried about uh, about the children and them living up in impoverishment and in a, a, a economic ruin. Yeah, exactly. That's that's now that's the strategic aspect, isn't it? Because, you know, they're saying, you know, as you said earlier, relying on technology and, you know, children's future. Well, the thing is, if since our economy is important, if we you know, stop relying on it, then that means our economy will collapse, meaning that we will become a vulnerable country. And so, which could mean war, which could mean other countries could use that for their own advantage um, and use use us. And that's not a good future for our children, it's not. Um, so they, they thought it's a very short term, just like everything, it's a very naive short term outlook the left has, you know, stop relying on technology. Well, the thing, well, as I said, economic growth, technological growth. If we didn't have those, we would be invaded by other people. And that means children don't have a future. And considering the fact that the whole, um, the whole crux to their argument is this, you know, climate change rhetoric, which is false in the first place. So they, it's, it's all lies that are supporting their argument in the first place. Yeah. And it's it's still like I, I like that the Liberal Party said we actually want to build coal-fired power stations now. I mean that's an important breakthrough because I think uh, the Australian people they they're not worried about the the planet warming now. They're worried uh, like I, like I said if if the electricity is going to be running. So uh, this has given the uh, the Liberal Party a chance to back away from these high renewable energy targets, uh, but they still won't. Uh, deny this like the alleged consensus on climate change like they won't say that oh maybe climate climate change isn't real and they won't they, they they say oh we're not for ridiculously high renewable energy targets we just want a lower one so they're, they're sort of they're trying to play it both ways saying oh we still support uh you know some action oh but just you know not as extreme as what's going on in south australia so they're, they're not being as courageous as they could be then but we need to understand that it's hard to change your platform overnight you know it's yeah, going to be hard but, for but look at what trump's did he's like completely dismantled the the climate change apparatus in the united states he has but you know he was a presidential i think uh, let's look at this way he was in the election he you know he was a candidate in the election he used that so i think the liberal party it's i do understand it's hard to change now because they're already in government um and they you know they to the election they took a particular policies into the election and they got voted um on that as well so but the thing is the liberal party in the next election could use this and be like trump and say you know what we were wrong for a while we get that we're sorry you don't have to say sorry but you know we were wrong just accept that and you know start actually supporting non-renewable energy you know just uh, they could change their platform in the next election and that could work for their own advantage as well um and that's what i would like to see but the problem is that turnbull's still a uh, uh, global warm uh, global warming climate yeah. change adherent i mean so he can't exactly oh i don't think he would want to completely uh, uh roll back uh, renewable energy policy he still wants to stick with the the paris climate accord so uh that is is uh, that's why he's stuck with this line oh i don't i don't want to go go as far far as labor but yeah it, it, I, I would certainly admire the the liberal party a bit, a bit more if they if they you know were were not afraid to take on the labor party and saying you know we're not going to follow this you know green religion anymore yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, as I said, it is a bit, um, you know, Malcolm Turnbull is um, still a believer in that sort of cult, that climate change cult. Um, and, you know, even we have even the most conservative people in the party are still using that, you know, 23.5 percent um, sort of argument. You know, Senator, Senator James Pat- Patterson, he always keeps using, you know, um, our 23.5 percent target is is good. You know, he's, he's still using that um, argument as well. So I suppose it is a bit 
uh, it is a bit hard, uh, sort of impossible to see them change. But yeah, what, what we're saying is it'll be good if they change. We, they can use this situation uh, in the next election, you know, just start to support normal energy like a normal person. Yeah. So we'll move on to our next topic now, which is the Western Australian state election, which is on March the 11th. We've, we, we're, we're in the midst of planning our special live stream event for, for that election night. Uh, so th that'll be very exciting. But yeah, the campaign there over there is uh, well and truly underway there with One Nation looking like they could have the balance of power, at least in the, the upper house. Uh, but they have been having trouble with some of their candidates. For example, uh, one David Archibald had a, a go at um, uh, single mothers. Uh, there was another one, Cameron uh, Bakwoski. I think I said that. He uh, was discovered on his Facebook page, liked, liked a whole bunch of pages which had six sexually explicit content. There was this week, okay. there was Michelle Myers, who said that uh, gay activists were using Nazi and Soviet style mind control tactics. Uh, <laughs> and there, just today, there was another one, Richard Eldritch, who made Twitter comments about uh, gays, uh, Muslims, and uh, Indonesian journalists. Uh, so, the, especially the left wing media are uh, using these people to discredit One Nation, saying, oh, how, uh, you know, look at this, you know, uh, circus of candidates that. Uh, uh, one Nation are putting forward, and uh, the reason why this this has become uh, a big deal this week is because the Liberals announced they were doing a preference deal with One Nation, which is uh, unprecedented, and then they also put them ahead of the the, uh, the National Party, which caused a or caused a rift in the coalition. Yeah, um, the candidates with the candidates. I mean. I don't mind if I don't care if they're offensive. I don't care if they're triggering. That's not the point here. And the point here is, you know, I think I do have to admit that some of them did act a bit like clowns, to be honest. Um, not the Twitter comments. The Twitter comments, I, I think, are fine. You know, he said what he wanted to say. That's Twitter. That's a different story. But, you know, things, saying things like, you know, gay activists are using Nazi and Soviet tactics. Um, I think you could say something more constructive. If you want to be politically incorrect, say something more constructive. Like Shane Julian said something quite constructive. I, 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 I yeah. Know that. Um, like why yeah. did she like yeah? Shane Julian's like comments like although a lot of people disagreed with them, were actually uh, quite measured. Like why is she disendorsed yeah. yet? All these other people are allowed to stay. Who like Shane Julian used like I, I'd say civil language. A lot of the these candidates have used you know quite vulgar language. Yet they're allowed to stay. She used civil language, and she had a she made a good argument. She used sources. She used articles. She was like, you know, she was sharing articles around and saying, you know, this happened, pedophile fathers who adopted children and, you know, all that. And so therefore, you know, she went on to say something, all that, all the other things that were triggering. Um, but, you know, she was, they were measured. They were constructive things to say. But these, you know, again, I think I find them funny. The, you know, the gay activists, you know, the single mothers. I find them funny. But... Yeah, like, like I'm all for like triggering the left. Like, I, yeah, like it, like it makes me laugh. But like, you know, just to see Fairfax and the ABC, and of course the Labor Party saying, "Oh, it's so horrible." Yeah. Oh, you know what these candidates are saying, but sort of like, yeah, like they do make make these candidates. You know, uh, looking at looking at it objectively, it do, it does yeah. make them look silly, and it's 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 not helpful. It's not, and the thing is, the the those one nation. I mean, for for us, you know, the, what they said is fine for us because we are one nation supporters. We know what they mean. We know what they're doing because we do the same thing. We trigger the left. But mm. the thing is, one nation should also be. Uh, um, trying to appeal to the normal conservatives, the normal right wingers who are a bit who are more normies. Um, and sort of these attempts, these things won't help one nation appeal to that demographic. It'll help it'll keep one nation um, popular among us, people like us who know what it's like, like who know what they're doing, who understand them. Um, but you know, if they're trying to appeal to normies, then it's gonna be a little bit hard by having candidates say these things. I mean Lacking sexually explicit pages, again, that's a bit of an eye opener. Yeah, One Nations, or even in their first incarnation, had trouble with vetting candidates. I, I think it's because 
I, I, and I don't mean to be disparaging when I say this, but when you source candidates from uh, ordinary people in the community, uh, you know, they're, they're, there's a lot that are bound to have uh, colourful co colourful pasts. So yeah, yeah so, so that's a problem that one, uh, one Nation faces because, you know, they're made up of regular folk who sort of, uh, you know, do, uh, uh, don't have what is the traditional sort of politician CV. And so that's yeah. like, like, if you look at the major parties, a uh, major party, uh, members and uh, wannabe candidates. I mean, they're told to be very careful with their social media, and uh, you know, they're they're on strict directions from head office. Don't post anything like this and that. So there, there's a lot more discipline in the major parties than there is for for One Nation, which is which yeah. which, uh, which is the why they're getting into trouble with these candidates. Yeah, I mean, you know, One Nation is having some difficulties with that in that front. Um, I think sometimes I feel like Pauline is being a bit too nice. I think Pauline allowed them to say controversial things, and I think they too, sort of took it a bit too seriously and sort of started to joke about it. Um, but you know, they should they should make sure that their candidates know what and what not to say. Be politically incorrect, please, by all means. Be offensive, be politically incorrect, but make sure it's constructive. You know, make sure just like Shan Julin did. You know, make yeah. sure it's constructive. I mean, sort of making it sort of a bit, you know, uh, acting like a comedian. I mean, I mean, with these stories coming out, James Aspie must be having a fit. Yeah, I think. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't know what's happening. You know, gay activist. I don't know what's happening with that. Um, the Twitter comments. Um, you know, it's yeah. I don't know. Will he try and intervene and kick them out? I don't think so. Maybe not, because you know that that means like four people out probably. That means. Well, One Nation, like it's still a party based in Queensland and around Pauline, so sort of yeah. uh, in Western Australia, it's 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 got it's got a very light 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 infrastructure, which is which is another problem as well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, there have been suggestions that Pauline should focus on Queensland um, first and maybe run for premier in Queensland. Um, she said no, she doesn't want to do that. You know, she wants to make sure that the whole, she wants to work for the whole country um, instead of just for her state. Um, she said her state was just a starting point. Um, but you know, uh, again, as you said, light infrastructure. You know, it's it's comp it's the other side of the country, so it's going to be a bit hard. Um, but you know, speaking of Western Australia, we did have the preference deal um, with the Liberals. Yes, uh, so they've they've announced uh, Liberal Party that they're they they're not just putting One Nation high on the ticket; they're actually putting them above the the National Party now. Yeah. the relation between the the Liberals and the Nationals is a bit different in Western Australia. That there is no coalition agreement; the Nationals uh, are completely separate. Uh, so there, there's not like in the in the eastern states there's there's not this uh, like there is in the eastern states there's not this formal agreement so uh, the liberals are at liberty to to negotiate uh, to negotiate different preferences uh, than what other uh, state liberal parties would do but it's it still caused a rift in the coalition in Canberra um, people like um, Barnaby Joyce are, are, are not happy and the National Party have retaliated, I think, pretty stupidly by yeah. putting, putting the Greens above the Liberals in some seats. That's that's disgraceful. Like, yeah. why would you? Why? why like, why? <laughs> um, it doesn't make sense at all. And you know, uh, well, the, the Greens. The... Yeah, the the nationals in Western Australia are actually quite socialist. So, um, oh really? Because, okay. Because the the state nationals party actually support uh, bringing back a, a mining tax on. Oh okay. Yeah. That's so, that's very um paradoxical. I don't know. Well, like I said, in... the, the nationals in Western Australia are a bit different, but yeah. Yeah. Still. Yeah, that's. Uh, Barnaby Joyce that's... then having to defend a preference deal with the Greens. I know. I mean, it's stupid. It's it's ill thought out. You haven't thought about the bigger picture here. You haven't thought about the nationals federally. Um, Barnaby Joyce will have to defend them somehow. I don't know how. I feel bad for him now. Mm. <laughs> um, maybe it's karma. Who knows? But um, I do. I do know that um, this preference deal has actually had a rift within One Nation as well. Um, I know two candidates have said, you know what? We are not gonna um, conform to this to, th to this new policy. We are going to actually. Um, preference our own people because they are angry that 
Pauline did preference the Liberals, who she said she hated, because um, they hate, the, the candidates hate the Liberals, and one reason they joined One Nation be, was because of that Liberal hatred. And I think, um, I don't mind, I don't think Pauline did a wrong thing by doing that, because it's a different story. I know Pauline hates the Liberals, but then she said, you know, I, I'm doing this because I want to make sure One Nation wins the election. That's why I want to do it. And she said so already. She said in the first place, from the first point onwards, she said, I want to do things that will make sure One Nation will succeed. So I don't really see anything wrong with Pauline's decision anyway. Well, she's been pretty defined in defending the deal. And she said to yeah. those candidates, if you if you don't like the preference deal, then don't stand for One Nation. I mean, yeah. um, and uh, this is, again, brought in criticism that, you know, One Nation is too uh, <laughs> dictatorial, which we, which we, we, we talked about that in the uh, the last episode, so we yeah. won't, won't go over it, over it again. But yeah. uh, it once again highlights that, yeah, uh, party discipline has has also been another problem within uh, One Nation. I think she is entitled to, you know, uh, of ma make this decision uh, on preferences. I mean, uh, preferences in the major parties they're they're always determined by like state committees or state executives. So this is not uh, unusual. And yes, these yeah. these candidates just and who do they want to give their preferences? to instead do they want to give them to the labor or the greens yeah exactly who who's left who's there that you could give it to um i do know one of the candidates is actually a labor voter so he might give it to labor like he's a traditionally a labor voter um i know that the other is on the opposite the other is um a mining executive and he's i'm assuming is more of a liberal um voter um but yeah i mean who are you going to give the, them too and you know just the the reasoning is again i don't like the reasoning behind uh, what the opponents are saying you know pauline hates hated liberals we thought she hated liberals we hate liberals and what are you doing you know well look at it again look at the big picture here it's not about you know this there's no time to focus on those petty differences right now this is about making sure one nation gets a more stronger foothold on the country in our society and that's what Pauline's doing, and I, I I support that. I don't see anything wrong with that. Yeah, and it's also the reason, another reason why this preference deal has taken place. I mean, the Liberals always had a policy of putting one one nation last. This was yeah. back, uh, during their first incarnation. But of course, Colin <laughs> Barnett, the Liberal Premier of Western Australia, is desperate uh, to retain power. I mean, he's doing terribly in the the two party preferred uh, 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 polls, and so he. Th uh, he thinks this is probably the only way to to save his his premiership, and it's interesting because most people consider uh, Western Australia to be quite a conservative state, and the fact that the polls are pointing to uh, a Labor landslide victory, the reason why uh, this is happening is because because of the the downturn in the the mi uh, mining industry there in Western Australia, which is uh, which, which has turned the state government finances uh, in. Uh, in into, into the negative and so yeah. uh, so they're running budget budget deficits now and so uh, the the Liberal government has has been viewed as not managing the state's finances very very well during the mining boom and splurging it out and so this yeah. is so this mm -hmm. is why that uh, they're, they're actually prepared to give labor a go yeah I mean uh, that this is a different topic, I suppose, but you know, um, just because just because you have, I think I think the liberals were being a bit too complacent. Just because you have minds and resources doesn't mean you have to be very complacent um, and sort of not care about your spending, your your fiscal policy, because you do have to care about that. Um, see Venezuela, what happened in Venezuela? You know, oil, the country with the richest oil reserves in the world, focused too much on their resources instead of focusing on the long term. And now they're all the way down in, at the bottom. Same thing, similar thing with Western Australia, you know, focus too much on their, my, on, on their resources, which is, uh, you have to focus on them. I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't focus on them. What I'm saying is don't sort of focus on them too much. Let the market decide um, in a capitalist way. Um, so, you know, they did that and now it's it's hard for them so you know it's they reaped i'm oh, sorry they sow and now they reap so really there's, there's nothing much to say about that yeah like i don't think that labor would be good for western australia but it just oh shows, no yeah it just shows what what a bad job the, the state liberal government has done. exactly yeah just like it's a, it's a trend isn't it? it's a trend these days liberals are doing such a bad job everywhere um when it comes to they're meant to be conservative but you know we know that um 
for example, 86 percent of our well of our income tax is paid on welfare, even by the liberals um, who have done nothing about it. So we expected economic conservatism. They're not giving us economic conservatism. And now they're wondering why they're losing to, to parties like One Nation. Um, well, it's a pretty obvious reason. Look at the past and you will see why you are losing to One Nation. Um, and, I, you know, maybe this deal will work in their favor. They realized that, I suppose, in Western Australia. So maybe this deal will work towards their favor. Yeah. So let's go overseas now, which is our next topic is Trump versus the deep state. Now, what is the deep state? We should define that first. The deep state, yeah. I only learned about this uh, the past 24 hours. The deep state refers to the fact that uh, the United States government, it's not run by the people who are elected to be president or congressman. It's run by the bureaucracy and the military yeah. industrial complex, and they yeah. make the decisions. And the relevance to this, to Trump, is that uh, the intelligence uh, agencies, the CIA, the NSA, uh, appear to have been leaking to the, the mainstream media because they leaked uh, the fact that uh, Mike... Uh, the former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn uh, had spoken with uh, uh, a Russian diplomat uh, about sanctions. So as the reason why uh, Michael Flynn had to resign was not because he discussed uh, sanctions with this Russian diplomat, but because uh, because of this leak, he had ended up misleading the Vice President Mike Pence about it. So it wasn't for speaking with the Russians he got into trouble, but the fact that he misled uh, Mike Pence, which forced his re resignation. So it was more of a technical resignation, but but the leak was designed to, because Flynn wanted to have positive relations with Russia, uh, the uh, the intelligence communities wanted, want, wanted to have him removed, which they succeeded in doing. And then the next day, yeah. there were more allegations that the Trump campaign had, uh, had communications with Russian intelligence they didn't uh, they, they didn't allege this was in the New York Times they didn't allege that they were assisting with the alleged hacking of the election uh, but just that all oh, there was contact and so they they it's, it's now clear that the intelligence agencies are actively working against Trump's policy of trying to have positive relations with Russia yeah, the intelligence agency hates the fact that Trump wants to work with Russia to defeat ISIS they're they're driven by conservatism they their religion is sorry neoconservatism i should say their religion is neoconservatism and you know the fact that trump is trying to work with the with the traditional enemy is very triggering for them that's why they that's why they're trying to undermine trump's presidency probably even try and oust him um you know th there has always, always been talk that it was them the the intelligence agencies the um the the, the military it was there's there has always been um conspiracy theories saying that they were ultimately the people who controlled the country um if that is the case that's very disheartening yeah um, yeah i think it was pretty naive of some people to think that once trump won that 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 would be a uh, jo job done that Trump would be able to yeah. to change everything automatically. Uh, yeah. Like coming in as an outside, like coming in as an outsider and trying to change because there's still the the huge United States bureaucracy that's yeah. going to be against him. So uh, and, and they're determined not for for nothing to be changed. So. Uh, this is it's it was never going to be easy for Trump to to change things and we're seeing that now and you know they they look like that if Trump doesn't do what they say they're going to try and and bring him down and, and it's interesting that neocons uh, such as Bill Crystal from the Weekly Standard and Evan McMullen who was the uh, one of the third party presidential candidates yeah. have said that the intelligence agencies is actually right for them to defy the president because he's uh, colluding with an adversary but why is it up to the intelligence agencies to to say oh we think Ru russia is an enemy so uh you know we uh, we can, you know, do what we want. No, isn't it? A, isn't the elected president? Doesn't he decide who America's enemies are? He does, and he's trying to. He's trying to make sure that Russia is friendly with the U.S. But you know, they're not letting him, and that that's very hard. Um, as you said, you know, he can't change everything overnight. And you know, hopefully he can. I mean, we have we have seen things where he sort of seems to um, try. We, it seems to indicate that he was trying to maybe um, appeal to the intelligence agencies and maybe try and calm them down so they will stop 
intervening with him. Um, like, for example, he did condemn Iran recently for nuclear weapons. Um, you know, I was surprised by that. I didn't expect that. Um, but I understood why he would do that because, you know, he, again, he's trying to sort of make, make sure that the intelligence agencies are not as loud as they should be. Um, yeah, again, you know, yeah, it's hard to change. And, you know, we have seen, um, the thing is, People are saying that Trump fired um, him, uh, Ma Michael Flynn, because he was misleading the vice president. There are people who don't believe that, but I have seen. Uh, he, he resigned. Uh, that that yeah. yeah, that's the official line. Yes, yeah. So sorry. He yeah, he re resigned. Some people are saying he was fired. Some people don't believe either of that. Um, but I think we just. That's okay, but the uh, but the interesting thing is they are blaming the Democrats, they're blaming the new conservatives for trying to undermine Trump. You know, that's 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 the important issue here. Yes, people might not believe the reason why Flynn was Flynn left. Maybe it was he was resigned. Maybe he fired. He was fired. But you know, even they, those people are saying, you know what, the Democrats have trying something to do with it. They're trying to undermine Trump as usual. They're new conservatives, um, and that's not gonna that's gonna be a bit bad for his presidency. I, and to Trump's credit, he hasn't bowed down to, down to them. When they were they were holding these inquiries into Rus uh, Russian hacking, I uh, remember that Trump tweeted like, you know, why would anyone not want to have a good relationship with Russia? He he was very uh, defiant then. And then there was that uh, more recently last week that interview with uh, Bill O'Reilly that Trump did, and like O'Reilly is like, oh, you know, Putin's a killer, and you know, Trump rightly pointed out like, you know, you think we're so innocent as well. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. I mean, look at what they've done. I think I'm pretty sure, I am pretty sure they killed more people than Putin ever has. I'm pretty sure. Um, you know, I uh, I just remember Trump did ask Putin to give Crimea back to the Ukraine. That was something I found very surprising to hear from Trump. Um, wasn't expecting that. But again, I think he's trying to appeal to those neoconservatives just to calm them down, just to distract them, tell them, you know, I'm trying to do something. Um, yeah, so just you, you don't need to worry too much. Yeah, but, um, but we know what, you know, Trump, like, is really aiming for. I mean, he's having to sort of compromise, like, on some foreign policy areas, but he's still being pretty defiant against the intelligent, yeah. intelligence community, which is good. And That's uh, admirable, yeah. Yeah, and I was also surprised that, like, given that we, we are seeing these leaks from the uh, intelligence community, which are pretty concerning, they, they still let uh, Rex Tillerson become Secretary of State. I was glad that, that he, he was able to, to be confirmed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Leaks are a bit c concerning. Again, I don't. Again, who knows what they're talking about? This is the same. It's the same agencies who actually said Iran had nuclear weapons. Uh, 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 are you talking about Iraq? That? Iraq. Sorry, Iraq. Same agency that said Iraq had nuclear weapons. Um, I don't really want to trust them. I don't. I don't think I should trust them. I don't think a smart person would tr trust them. But we would try and pay attention to them because they might. Who knows? Who knows? They are powerful. Um, and they could, they might have the power to take Trump down if he doesn't conform to their, um, to their motives, and that's a problem. And, and you know, again, I well, hope that doesn't happen. Yeah, Democrats are already like saying, you know, we're getting ready to impeach him. I mean, yeah. and, and there's plenty of uh, re uh, near conservative Republicans, such as obviously John McCain and Lindsey Graham, but even Marco Rubio, who, if Trump doesn't uh, toe their line, he they, they will they would be more than happy to team up to get rid of him. In fact, they actually tried, um, they actually took the first step to do that. Um, people didn't really know that because the media didn't report on this, obviously. But they did um, pass, I think, or they're trying to pass some sort of legislation that will make Trump be more transparent. So meaning Trump has to tell Congress every single thing he does. He has to tell them, give them information and be transparent about every single thing he does. Um, and that's considered to be the first step to try and impeach a president um, to, to make to make them sort of be transparent to the Congress. And um, it's just the first step. We don't want to jump to conclusions, but yes, that is quite concerning. Yeah, uh, but uh, 
of course, the uh, if these neocons and Democrats think that they're they're going to get away with removing Trump from office, oh, uh, yeah. given that you know he democratically won an election yeah. and uh, probably uh, came to the presidency with uh, f or from his supporters a great deal of enthusiasm. I mean, that would really destabilize the United States. It would. It would. That would be. That would that could destroy the country, you know, um, you know, it might end up, it might end up being like an apocalypse if that happens, you know, people won't like that half the country voted for him, you know, the majority of the actual map of the US, the majority of that map is red anyway. Huh. So, you know, if that does happen, there will be chaos unleashed yeah. and they might have a civil war. Yeah. I, I'm actually more concerned about what's happened this week rather uh, than, you know, all the leftist riots that, yeah. have, uh, that have happened over the past few months. I mean, they're just yeah. like, uh, you know, mindless idiots just yeah. smashing, yeah. smashing things. But, you know, Trump is being undermined by very powerful people in the uh, in the bureaucracy and in Congress as well. I think that 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 is the real threat. That is a real that is a real threat. You know, the, the leftist protests, they were just that was a comedy for us. That was yeah. a show of comedy. You know, we laughed at that. It wasn't really serious. And we were just like, look, look at the tol tolerant left. They're rioting. Mm. They're, they're bashing people. They're destroying shops. They're destroying the businesses of companies that actually um, supported Hillary Clinton in the first place. Um, you know, we were m making fun of that for good reason, because they were being stupid and ironic and hypocritical is the left. But, you know, as I said, you know, the, the, a real issue is what's happening now with actual insiders, actual people in the in the, the White House, in the in the actual system, trying to undermine Trump. If they do, then you know, it's it's going to be worse than World War Three probably for America, even a civil war. Yeah, it's it's def it's turning out to be yeah much more difficult than I think a lot of people a lot of his supporters were were thinking. Uh, we yeah, sh we should move on to our final topic now. I'll let you talk about it, Sukith. Yeah. So um, on Monday we had a Q and A. I never watched Q and A. Yeah, I we watched should, it we once. should explain. Uh, yeah. For, for those uh, who don't know, Q and A is a panel discussion program on uh, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation uh, every week, where they have a panel of about five or six uh, people and. The, the show host Tony Jones and the studio audience are all very left wing, and it's basically yeah. uh, uh, a, a left wing uh, attack program circle. on, on, on conservatives. <laughs> it's, it's a left wing circle jerk, and um, you know it never gets anything done really. They just argue, they shout, they shout at each other, they ask questions. That's it. No one, no one's happy. No one agrees to anything. It's awful no to watch. It is awful to watch. However, this time we watched it this time because, um, well, one of our editors, Damien Ferry, was in the in in the audience and he asked a question. So we watched it this time um, to see what will happen because um, he is a member of the United Conservative Party um, here in Australia and he he and one of his other um, colleagues were with him in the audience and he asked a question um, about the Liberal Party moving towards the left. Um, but in the in the program, there was a. <laughs> I think she's probably the biggest oxymoron you would ever meet in your life. Like the biggest sort of hypocrite, like ironic person you will ever meet because she happens to be an Islamic feminist, um, which is a new fad with the feminists these days. Um, and she said that you know she said Islam is the most feminist religion out there and. You know, we all know what that means. Um, and she also had a very big um, argument with um, the other panel member, who was Jackie Lambie, a senator um, in the federal parliament. And she said, you know, you know what, Australia, this Australia, we can't have Sharia law here. We will have um, Australian law in this country because guess what? It's Australia. And then she, uh, Yasmin, her name was Yasmin Abdul Majid. She got triggered at that, and she they started having a screaming match each, at each other. And 
um, she was saying, you know, Sharia law is all about, you know, praying five times a day, etc. You know, it, it means nothing, but yeah. we all and, know what it means. And there was a there, uh, there was an article in Fairfax just yesterday uh, with another uh, so-called uh, Islamic feminist saying saying the same thing. And yeah, uh, Yasmin, she did a follow-up video on the yes, left wing she... news website Junkie uh, talking about what Sharia really is. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was called WTF. So, what the f is Sharia law? Anyway, that was what it was called. Um, again, she was using. She. Uh, it's pretty obvious. She was employing this Islamic strategy. It's a strategy called takia, um, which is that you can use. Um, you can lie about Islam. You can lie or hide anything or be dishonest about Islam in order to protect yourself. You know, because if you are under the threat of being, you know, persecuted for being an Islamic person or if you're under threat of being um, deported or, you know, if your religion is under threat of being um, sort of banned from your country, then you can use takia to actually sort of lie about your religion and make sure that people are, you know, oblivious to what it really is. Um, and she was using that. That was obvious. That much is obvious. She's from Sudan. And, you know, Jackie Lamb said, you know what, she was adamant. She kept saying, it's Australia, it's Australian law. I don't care where you're from. I don't care about your feelings. Um, this Australia, that's what it is. If you want to live here, then assimilate. That's what she was saying. And people are triggered at that, which I was very disappointed at. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, like her saying that, oh, you know, Sherry, it's this, you know, innocent, uh, you know, just following your faith. I mean, let's look at, you know, sh you only have to look at uh, the countries that that practice Sharia law, such as Saudi yeah. Arabia, the UAE mm -hmm. and Qatar. I mean, Saudi Arabia, women aren't allowed to drive in yeah. those countries I mentioned. Uh, you know, women don't have... Uh, uh, their their evidence in court is not is not worth the, the same uh, as a man. There's uh, yeah. female genital mutilation is commonplace. So uh, uh, honor killings, uh, also, uh, also um, uh, forced forced marriages, child marriages. I mean, they're, they're living under you know Sharia law is is not pleasant pleasant at all for women. It's not. And they have an argument now. She used that argument. So um, I think Jackie Lamb used the Saudi Arabia argument and she said, you know, their culture is not the religion. You know, culture is different to faith. Well, that's obviously a lie because Saudi Arabia is actually the most, you know, proper conservative Islamic country there is. That's fine. I don't care. They can do whatever they want back in their countries. But Saudi Arabia is the most conservative, most traditional, the, it's the proper form of Islam. She was saying it's their culture, it's different. No, it's not. Saudi Arabia is Islam. Yes, Iran is very progressive. It is for an Islamic country. Um, but Iran isn't, it's not proper Islam, okay? It's, it's, it's a bit like Protestantism anyway. Um, you know, we have I Iraq, we have UAE, who are quite progressive from an Islamic perspective. Again, not proper Islam. Saudi Arabia has proper Islam. So you can't say culture is different because the thing is that culture is Islamic. That's Islamic culture. We know that. Yeah, and it's also worth pointing out that Yasmin, the reason why she's able to have her interpretation of uh, Islam and be a feminist uh, in Australia is because we, ha we have... Uh, pretty mm -hmm. much gender equality here in Australia. I mean, yeah, exactly. She, she's much free to be a woman and pursue what she wants in Australia. If she was in one of those Middle Eastern countries under sh a Sharia, which, Sharia, which yeah. they see, seem to defend, I mean, she'd be pretty much chained to the home. She would be. She wouldn't be allowed in that show, in the like in a TV show in the yeah. first place. She wouldn't be allowed close to a TV studio, um, because that's how it is. Again, I don't care. That's the, that's the traditions. I don't really care about that. But it just the, the fact that you're trying to mislead the public in a Western country about what Islam really is, you're trying to make it look like it's the most peaceful religion out there. You know, you're saying you're saying that wearing the hijab, covering up is is, you know, empowering because it means you can choose who looks at your body. Well, guess what? That's not the principle. The principle is it was used by the Islamic patriarchy to force women to cover up. It's 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 a law made by men to force you to conf conform to society. It's not meant to be some sort of empowerment. It's meant to be an Islamic way of making women lower, of expressing this Islamic notion that women are inferior, not because it's meant to empower you. So they have, they have misunderstood. I feel bad for Islam. They've, they've misunderstood the entire religion and spreading false info about Islam. I feel bad for Islam, really. <laughs> That's quite a weird uh, spin to put on it.
Yeah, well, you know, we, you know, I, I understand when people, I understand when religions are, you know, manipulated to sort of suit other people's agenda, you know. So I feel bad for them because Islam isn't like that. Okay, well, Islam is... He has been might have fooled the lefties, but yeah, yeah. most of us on, on the right who actually pay attention to uh, what Sharia law is, you know, yeah. uh, uh, called out, uh, you know, uh, a supposed explanation of what Sharia is for what it is, <laughs> a load of rubbish. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we saw backlash. We saw articles from all, the, all over the um, uh, news sources saying, you know, this isn't Sharia law. She was lying. Um, she was most likely using takia. Anyway, people know that. Takia, the word takia, now everyone knows what takia is. So the fact that she said that was ultimately regressive because now everyone thinks, well, everyone knows she used takia for her, for her purposes, which means that everyone now hates Islam even more. Well done. Uh, we should also point out that uh, one of our f fellow uh, news sites, Alt Right Australia, is going to be doing a a Q and A pull apart every week, yeah. uh, fact checking everything that's said on Q and A, <laughs> which I think is an admirable thing to do it because is. watching that show every week is torturous, and I think having to watch it more than once and like put together a highlights package is, uh, <laughs> uh, he, 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 uh, they deserve an award for it. They do. They deserve an award, and I saw a video of Ultra Australia doing um, mocking um, Yasmin Abdul Majid um, for for that um, for that follow up video about Sharia law, and you know I thought that was nice too. Well, that's all we've got time for this week. So thanks once again for Suka for being my co-host. <laughs> that's okay. It's my pleasure. And of course, uh, I'll just run through the usual end of show announcements. So don't forget to, if you haven't already, sign up to our email list at the unshackled.net slash subscribe. Don't forget to uh, check out the support section of our website to consider becoming a Patreon or donate via PayPal. And also don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher or TuneIn Radio or view the video version on YouTube. And don't forget to keep checking the unshackled.net on a regular basis for all the regular, regular news. And thanks once again for listening and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening everyone and we'll see you next time.